We've arrived at the Chateau de Germolles. It is the best preserved chateau of the Dukes of Burgundy. This is Matthew, one of the owners of yes. this beautiful chateau. How lucky you are. Can you tell us a little bit about its history? Yes, the thing is that the chateau was built during the 14th century. At that time, it was one of the properties of the Duke and the Duchess of Burgundy. You know that Burgundy was a duchy during the Middle Ages. Huh? Mm. At the head of it, there was a duke whose name was Philip the Bald during the second half of the 14th century. He was a very important person because he was the Duke of Burgundy, but he was also one of the brothers of the King of France. Huh? Mm. Philip the Bald, he was a prince, and he was married to the Countess of Flanders, whose name was Margaret of Flanders. That is very important on Flanders, which is more or less Belgium today. Huh? It was at that time one of the richest parts of Europe. So when Philip married Margaret, Margaret brought to Philip her own territories and richness, like Flanders. And because of the marriage between Philip and Margaret, Burgundy will be one of the richest parts of Europe at that time. Huh? And of course, Philip and Margaret, they did what do a prince. When you're a prince or a princess, when you're a member of the royal family, you have to build. Because that is the main strategy, you have to show who you are. Mm -hmm. Medias don't exist at that time. Yeah? If you want to exist, you build, you build a lot, and they had money for that. Imagine that during the 14th century, they had between one and 200 of properties, including almost uh, 20 oh. palaces. Huh? Uh, the <laughs> shame is that today most of them are largely uh, demolished, gone, uh, renovated, mutilated. And to the best results of these residences of the Duke and the Duchess of Burgundy, is the one you see in front of you. Your, your home, how yes. lucky are yeah, you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes not, maybe, but yes, I think <laughs> I am very lucky. Yeah? Today you see that there are two parts. There is the northern wing here with the gate and the two towers, and there is the eastern wing here. But during the 14th century, the two parts were linked because the hall which is visible here with the box tree was built. And the corner here, which is a whole today, was built also. Huh? Meaning that during the 14th century, the chateau was a rectangular chateau yes. with a rectangular courtyard inside. And all the wings were that high. What you see here is almost intact from the 14th century. Huh? So during the 14th century, the other wing was as tall as that one. And because the chateau was totally enclosed, the unique way to go inside was the gate you came through. It was a unique entrance of the chateau, but in front of it was a drawbridge. Mm. Because there was a moat over the chateau. So huh? they were safe in here. Yes. But there is one more thing to know before coming to see the first story. When at the end of the 14th century, Philip the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy, he became the owner of the land here. There was here a former chateau, which was a fortress, a chateau fort, like we say in French, huh? which was built during the 12th and 13th century. At the end of the 14th century, Philip the Bold acquired it, but quickly gave it to the Duchess. Here you are not in the Duke's place, you are in the Duchess' place, huh? because the chateau is a gift from Philip to Margaret, from the Duke to the Duchess. And when Margaret of Flanders, she obtained that ducal gift, she did some works, because it was just a fortress. When you are such a princess, you are not living in a fortress, you live in a palace, of course. Huh? So she did works during 15 years, costing a lot, to convert it to a castle like a new fashionable residence. And during the works, she decided not to demolish the place and to build a new one. Huh? She decided to keep some part of the former chateau inside of the new 14th century one. Meaning that all what you see here dates from the 14th century, uh, except the greenhouse here, huh? which was added during the mid 19th century, but all the rest dates from the 14th century. But inside of these 14th century walls, we'll see for beginning two rooms, dating from the 13th century, which are part of the former chateau kept inside of the oh, new 14th wonderful. century. So much history in this place. Yes, yes. The other thing is that the chateau after the Middle Ages was the property of the kings of France from the end of the 15th to the end of the 18th century, which is the French Revolution. At the end of the 18th century, because of the French Revolution, the chateau was sold like a national good. And so during the 19th century, it would be the property of several owners. But at the end of the 19th century, my family acquired it. So today, I'm one of the owners of the chateau because my family acquired the chateau one century and a half ago. Like that, you have the whole history of the chateau. Thank you. It's, it's a summary, yeah. <laughs> I love your keys. Yes, that one is the biggest one. That's huh? a that real That is the chapel key. And uh, it's a key dating, I think, from the end of the 16th, being of the 17th century. Yeah? <gasps> that's one of the oldest of the chateau. And that is for the chapel. Yes, but we we'll see the cellar now, which is here. See, we start every single tour in Burgundy in a cellar. <laughs> See. And it doesn't change in a chateau. <gasps> but what a cellar! <gasps> oh my goodness! And we've seen a lot of cellars in Burgundy <laughs> because we've seen a lot of wine, but yeah. this is the most magnificent of yeah, them all. Yeah, yeah so you think that it's a big one and it's very well conserved. She kept the old cellar inside of the new chateau. Because of that, we have that 13th century cellar in the 14th century chateau. 
the Duchess would have been keeping food and wine in here. Wine was critically important at the time because it was usually safer than water. The alcohol killed a lot of the bacteria, it was safely kept in barrels, it wasn't being polluted in wells, so it was not only delicious. There is one thing which on Hillering centuries, which was the level of the ground, because that is original level, huh? but yes. it was not always like that. Uh, the things that during the 19th century, it was very wet and humid. Mm. So to avoid humidity here, so if you fill up the cellar with rubble, put things all over the ground higher. So what you see here along the wall, that is a level of the 19th century ground, which was higher and upper. Yes. But here during many years, we did some excavations huh, to reboot the level like it was. And here we are, and we discovered the bases the of base the columns. The base of the column. Yes. But we discovered also many other things, because when during the 19th century, they filled up the cell with rubble, they took things from the chateau itself. So they put here some sculpted stone, floor ties, and so on. And we discovered that during the cell of the excavations. Wow. And during the tour, you will see many things discovered here. Fantastic. Now we are going into the chapel, which is situated right next to the drawbridge, which was often the case. This way, God was protecting the entrance to the chateau. The chapel here dates also from the 13th century. So like the cellar, it's also part of the old castle kept inside of the new 14th century palace. Huh? And it is the same architecture as in the cellar because it's the same time huh? with a very Romanesque window with a very Gothic ceiling, like in the cellar. Uh, but the thing is that here during the Middle Ages, imagine that the walls were not stony like that. All that was covered, plastered, and the plaster was painted. Huh? Today it's gone, uh, but here and there, for example, on the rib, which is here, you can see some rest of the original painting, some red and black things, which are remain of the paintings covered in the world before. But what is very funny is that when during the 14th century, Margaret, she did the works, you know, to convert it to old castle like a new one, huh? she kept the chapel here. She did not transform it a lot, but what she did is that she decided to build another chapel, meaning that here we have no one chapel, but two chapels, which are one on the top of the other. So that is the lower chapel dating from the 13th century, but on the top there is the upper chapel dating from the 14th century. Because for her, the chapel here was not correct. It was not fashionable enough. Just look the wash basin here is a real Romanesque one. She wanted to have a new Gothic modern chapel, so she built it on the top. The second problem is that here we are on the ground floor, which is not correct. Because when you're a prince or princess, you do not leave one floor. You leave first floor, which is the noblest level. Huh? Of course, she had her apartment first floor, and she had the chapel first floor. Uh, when you're a prince or princess, you do not go to the chapel one per week. Huh? You go to the chapel one or more, but per day. So you have your chapel next to your apartment, which is first floor. So for all these reasons, she built up the upper chapel and will go to see it in a while. You see here and there two arrows slits, which are very bizarre, because yes. we're in a, in a place for praying, not for fighting. So it's very bizarre to see that kind of arrow slit here. But this were done during the 15th century. Huh? Uh, in the lowest part, you see a round part corresponding to little cannons, which were really used during the 15th century, so it could not be older. Huh? And because we have many archives concerning the chateau, we know when and why these receipts were done. Uh, you know, Philip the Bold, he was the first Duke of Burgundy, but in that dynasty there were three others, huh? his son, his grandson, his grand-grandson, whose name were John the Fearless, Philip the Good, and Charles the Bold, four Dukes of Burgundy in that dynasty. Huh? But at the end of the 15th century, during the time of Charles the Bold, the last and fourth one, Burgundy was much bigger than before. Eh? It went to Holland, Amsterdam, for example. That was a Burgundian city. Eh? And Burgundy was so mighty and huge that the Duke he wanted to do with that an independent country. But that idea was not, you know, happy for everybody. For example, the King of France, he didn't want at all to see an independent Burgundy. Eh? There was a, a, a war between the Duke, Charles Bold, and the king, uh, whose name was Louis XI. And during that war, the duke fortified all his properties, including that one, including the chapel where we are, which was deconsecrated, and digging these two arrow slits in a hurry. It's not very well done. Huh? They rushed to do that. Huh? They converted the chapel like a bastion at the end of the 15th century. That's absolutely fascinating. Mm. And ha what happened in the war? Oh, the duke was defeated. At the end of the, of the 15th century, precisely in 1477, the duke will be defeated and killed in Nancy. And because of that, the chateau, which was a ducal property, became a royal property here. 
uh, that is in front of the main staircase of the chateau, which was named the Grand Staircase during the Middle Ages because it was the biggest in the chateau. Huh? But during the Middle Ages, it was much higher. Today, just one third of the staircase is conserved. It was a very grand staircase. Huh? But when you're a prince or princess, you do have a big staircase in your palace because it gives some something to the place. In fortresses, you haven't. You have just narrow ones huh? uh, because it's cheaper to build huh? and better for defensive reasons. And what is important here is not defense, but standing. Huh? So that staircase showed very well at the entrance that you were not in a common place. And to show that better, you see that in the pediment there is a rest of a relief. It was damaged during the French Revolution, but you see what it shows. A central part of it, there is a big coat of arm, the big coat of arm of Burgundy. Both sides of it, there are two lions, symbolizing majesty and power. And on the top, they were through the coats of arm, which are gone today, but you see the places of them. And these were the coats of arm of the three main provinces brought by Margaret to Philippe when she married the Duke, because when she married Philippe, she brought up to Burgundy her own territories, like Flanders. So there was here at the entrance, the whole list of the whole Burgundian territories. You knew coming to the chateau what was a Burgundian state. We'll go upstairs. Huh? Up we'll go the upstairs. grand staircase. Yes, that yeah, feels yeah, right. yes. We'll go to the very top. So you see very well the chateau from here, uh, which was totally unclosed during the Middle Ages. Huh? But what happened is that during the 17th, 18th century, the chateau was not very well maintained, meaning that at the end of the 18th century, that part of the chateau was not in good condition. Huh? The roofs were collapsing, like the walls. So what happened the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century? They continued destruction, which began before. Here, on the eastern wing, happened a fire at the end of the 19th century because of a storm, because of a lightning. Huh? And the fire destroys that part of the chateau, making the hole you see here, and cutting that wing into parts. And then the fire went north to the tower there and destroyed the top part of the upper chapel, which is on the top of the lower one. So 10 years ago, we decided with historical monuments, because the chateau is classified huh, like, like an historical monument, we decided to rebuild the vaulted thing of the chapel because we knew the shape of it, we knew it was a wooden one, we just rebuilt it the vaulted ceiling like it was. Uh, of course, we didn't rebuild no more the roof on the top uh, than the part missing here. We just rebuilt the vaulted thing of the chapel. And we, we'll go to see that in a while. Fabulous, life. yes. Before that, the terrace where we are, that was not a terrace. It was a room during the Middle Ages. Huh? You see here, very well, the place of the wall coming up. Meaning that outside of the towers, uh, you see that there were big stones. Huh? That was quite spectacular. Huh? When you went to the chateau at that time, when you saw the two big uh, towers with the big blocks, it was quite monumental. Huh? Inside there are little stones, but they were not visible at all because the wall went up. Here we were in a room huh? and all that was covered and plastered. Huh? And you see here two stone supports, two corbels, corresponding to beams, corresponding to a first ceiling. Because here during the Middle Ages, there were one, two, three rooms, one on the top of the others, which were guards' rooms. Soldiers were here because the unique entrance is underneath. That northern wing is a place for the guards. Remember, here in front there was a drawbridge, huh? because here was a moat. And here in front of you, there is the lower courtyard, because in a chateau at that time you have two parts. Huh? There is the upper courtyard, which is here, and that is the lower courtyard, which is also the chateau. Huh? The chateau it don't begin here, it begins there. That is also the chateau. And many of these buildings are dating partially from the Middle Ages. Uh, you know, Margaret of Flanders, she didn't want here to have just one more palace. She, they had so many others. So one more, one less. That was not the point for her. Huh? What she wanted here was a special place. A place linked to nature, because that was modernism. Uh, the thing is that at the end of the Middle Ages in Western Europe, for intellectual persons, huh? nature was the heart of modernism. Mm. So she wanted you not to have just one more palace, uh, no more a fortress, huh? but a palace linked to nature, a palace in the fields. That was very newer, um, very modern. Huh? So here she had many peculiar activities. Uh, there were good vineyards here on the hill. There were gardens also. For example, we know that in the thousand parts of the property was a huge rose garden. They did perfume with roses here. Yes. And there were many animals. For example, there were swans in the moat of the chateau. There were cattle of cows and of goats and sheep also. And the big building you see here, which is largely dating from that time, was, we think, uh, Margaret of Flanders' sheep pen, the house of sheep. Yeah. It must have been spectacular. Yeah, yes, yes, that was the idea. To show that it was not one of these common chateaus, but a palace linked to nature. We see something like a Renaissance chateau, but two centuries before the Renaissance time. Yes, and like Marie Antoinette, That's many it. centuries later. Exactly. 
it is announcing all this. Mm. Huh? Uh, of course, she needed to have person to take care of all this, huh? because she was not cutting by herself the wool of sheep, like you imagine. Huh? So here in the low courtyard, where the peasants and the workers were walking around, huh? for example, the house in front of you here was the house of the housekeeper, the, the state manager. She needed to have here one person living all, all year long. That was the housekeeper, and he was living here. Oh, now we're going through to the chapel, the new chapel. Oh, that is spectacular stonework yeah. that you still have. Yeah, the thing is that that is the upper chapel, which was built on the top of the lower chapel. The entrance was directly from the apartment of the Duke and the Duchess of Buckingham. It was that way. And what you see here is a holy water basin, because there is always a holy water basin at the entrance of the chapel. Meaning that the chapel began more or less here. Huh? That is not really the chapel. Huh? The chapel began there, meaning that it's not a huge big chapel. It's a little one because it's a precious one. Huh? It was a private chapel of the Duchess and her entourage. It was not for crowds. Huh? It was for between 20 and 40 persons, no more. But the chapel is a little bit bizarre, because what you see here is the nave of the chapel, and you expect at the end of the nave the choir, because in a normal church you have always the nave, and then you have the choir. But here not. You have, here you have the nave, and the choir is on the side, which is very uncommon. Huh? So to understand why the choir is not in the right position, I propose to you to go inside of the choir. In the footsteps of the Duchess. Yeah. Here we are in the choir. Huh? The altar was there. You see the place of it under that very gothic window. Here there is the wash basin and the tabernacle, all what you need in such a place. And in front of the choir, here there is a little room, which is the oratory, the place for praying. So here was Margaret of Flanders praying in front of the altar. Like you see, she had the best place and very comfortable one because there is a fireplace. There was no fireplace in the lower chapel. But in her chapel, the Duchess, she wanted to have a very comfortable place. But what is very bizarre, are, is a place of it, because in a normal church you have your choir, in front of it you have the nave. If you have one or two oratories, it is on the sides. Here it's exactly the opposite. If you put the oratory in front and the nave side, it's totally uncommon. It's never like that. But the thing is that during the Middle Ages, in the Burgundian court, it was very important to show how mighty were the princes. Huh? Putting Margaret of Flanders in front of the altar means that the courtiers coming with her to the chapel, it was like a spectacle. Huh? Margaret of Flanders was here in the oratory in front of the altar, like discussion with God, but on the side where the courtiers looking to that, it was like a spectacle. And the idea was to show how mighty she was. Huh? It was a way to show her prestige. Huh? That was very important because it was like that in the whole daily life of the Duke and the Duchess of Burgundy. Yes. Every time was here to show the prestige of the Duke and the Duchess of Burgundy. And of course, there were paintings on the walls, there were stained glass in the windows. What an extraordinary piece of theatre. What better way to show that her power comes directly from God to make the whole rest of the congregation have to look at her before they can even see the altar. That's it. Exactly. She was chosen. Exactly. It was a way to see that, definitely. The power of this imagery was understood for the next hundred years. Here is a diptych of Margaret of Austria, the great, great, great granddaughter of Margaret of Flanders, shown worshipping in a very similar way in front of the Virgin. It was hinged, so Margaret really would have been seen directly in front of the Virgin with the comfortable fireplace in the background. We're off to the grand room. <laughs> <laughs> that is the grand room, which is on the top of the cellar. Uh, it was named the grand room because it was the biggest in the chateau. It was that long and wide, it was very big, but much higher. Uh, here there were six meters more, it was much, much higher. But what happened is that during the 18th century it was partially destroyed, meaning that the wood structure, you see, dates from the 18th century. It was much higher before. And the place was a place for reception, which is not very visible today because it transformed it like a place for stocking wood during the 19th century. So uh, we'll do in the next year some restoration works to give some luxury to the place because it was very serious at that time. Imagine, for example, that there was here in front of you, covering the wall in front of you there, a huge big fireplace, which is no more here, but you will see it later in a while. You will see why. Uh, it was six meters long and four meters high. It was a big one. Huh? and very special one, because there were two pillars, one right, one left, supporting a flat balcony. The top was flat, and you could go up, huh? because on the right side was a little staircase to no. go upstairs. To yes. go onto the fireplace. Yes. That was a place for the menestrels, for the musicians, because they needed music in such a place. So the musicians, they went up on the fireplace. That was very spectacular, and that was a place, and the place, and the point. Uh, during the 19th century and during the 18th century, the top part was partially destroyed, but 
the two pillars remained. So one century ago, they were transported in another part of the chateau, and we go to see them later. Here, there are floor ties. Uh, you know, Margaret of Flanders was very rich, huh? So she commissioned to three factories in Burgundy, thousands of these terracotta floor ties, to put them on the grounds, first and second floors. Uh, sometimes they were just unicolored ones, like a black or yellow, which are the colors of Flanders, huh? But others are covered with patterns, which are here for ornamentation, but also to give some meaning to the place. For example, here there are some daisies, some Margarets, because we are in Margarets of Flanders' place. Here there are lions, symbolizing majesty and power, Hein, the lion is the king of the animals. Uh, here you have suns, but like you know in France, the sun is symbolizing the king. It will be true during the 17th century, but it was true before. Hein? Margaret of Flanders, she was the sister of the king of France. She wanted to show that, like with the fleur de lys you see here. Here there are roses, but she had the rude rose garden here. And the rose is a very important pattern in a symbolical way. Hein? What you observe is that these tiles were here for ornamentation, of course, hein? but also to give some symbolical meaning to the place. What you see here is a drawing which was done during the mid-19th century showing the chateau from the east but before the fire. And you do see very well here, for example, the entrance of the chateau. Here there is the upper chapel on the top of the lower one. Uh, the thing is that today all that is gone because of the fire. All that also. Uh, here we rebuilt it uh, ten years ago, the vaulted ceiling of the chapel, which was not visible at that time because it was under the roof. Huh? It's wonderful to be able to see it as it was. You're so lucky to have this engraving. Yeah, yes, we, we are lucky to have that. So that is very important, huh? precious. Drouet de Damartin, he was the official architect of the, of the ducal couple. Uh, he was also one of the architects of the King of France. Huh? Mm. So, uh, you know, he wanted to have here something which was very modern, not, not something which was like these old fortresses, mm. huh? but something which was very new. That part of the chateau, which is the best preserved of the two parts of the chateau, huh? show you three levels. Huh? There is a ground floor, the first and the second floor, which is interesting because showing to you how was the life here. Because Margaret of Flanders, she didn't live here all year long, huh? When you're a prince or princess, you do not live in one place. You travel always with many persons. But the ground floors were the level for domestic activities. Huh? And there were six or seven kitchens ground floor. But it's normal for such a crowd. Huh? The bathrooms were here, ground floor, thousand wing. But the best level is the first one. And that is very visible because first of all, you see the biggest windows showing to you that that is the best level. Here was the apartment of Margaret. Here was the apartment of Philip, and you see that the two ducal apartments were linked to the chapel because the hall was not. So you could go from the apartment to the chapel directly. And in the corner here, which is gone today, they were, during the Middle Ages, first floor, the apartment of the familiars. For example, here, where you see today the trees and the branches of the trees, was the apartment of the first children of Philip and Margaret, because Philip and Margaret, they had ten children. Huh? The first one was named John. It will be John the Fearless, the second Duke of Burgundy. We know that his apartment was here, the same is that it is gone today. But in a while, we see the apartment of his wife. Her name was also Margaret, and there are many Margaret at that time. Yeah. She was named Margaret of Bavaria. We'll go to see her apartment in a while. And second floor, there are little windows, but opening of very vast rooms. The room second floor are 10 meters high. Huh? That was the level for the courtiers. They organized the trips of the Duke and the Duchess and the whole daily life of them, like the banquets. And also they participate to the administration of the duty of Burgundy. So there were many courtiers and there were many rooms for them. Huh? Uh, today you see that there are seven rooms, but during the Middle Ages, because the chateau was bigger, there were more or less 20 rooms second floor. So the chateau was very well organized. It like must have been full of people. Can't yeah. imagine the yeah. bustle, the noise, yeah. the planning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing is that when she was not here, that part of the chat was very, very empty. Even if the lower could go, it was full because the peasants were always there. But when she was here, they were here in the low upper quarter between 1 and 200 persons, like you said, it was very noisy and so on. We'll go to see a kitchen, huh? ground floor. We're learning in Burgundy that the kitchen is one of the most important rooms uh, along with the cellar. I do agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> There were six or seven kitchen ground floor in that wing, huh? and each of them had a big fireplace like that, which is a tool for cooking for many persons. Huh? But the thing is that during the 14th century, that room was bigger because that wall didn't exist. Each room was as wide as the chateau itself. One wall looking to the courtyard, the other one looking to the garden, meaning that each room was as wide as the chateau itself. Uh, after the Middle Ages, he preferred to have more short rooms, more eatable ones. So very often, he built up a wall central part of the room, so have two rooms in one. Huh? That one was wondering, we think, the 17th century. Huh? And during the 19th century, he put up panels 
and then paintings on the walls. No paintings in kitchen during the 14th century. Paintings are very precious things. They were the tunically first floor, which is the best level, the princely one. Huh? Ground floor, second floor, they were just a plaster. Not for the courtiers, no more for the kitchens, but for the prince's first floor. Huh? So these paintings were done one century ago. But they are interesting because showing roses, they are inspired from the rose motif we saw in Thais before. Mm, yes. Of course, concerning the furniture which is here, it is not the furniture which was in the chateau at that time, because of course you will never see a chateau dating from the 14th century, which is original furniture, because 6th century and a half, uh, it's a lot. Huh? Of course, there are some medieval pieces here, but even if there are some medieval pieces here, they were not here during the Middle Ages. I would like to show you the room which is next, uh, because it's quite interesting to see. Absolutely beautiful room. I think it's interesting to go here, because of course the room where we are was totally organized during the mid-19th century, because of course the rule of the chateau didn't end with the Middle Ages. So it's important to understand what was the history of the chateau after the Middle Ages. The room here, where we are, was totally covered during the 19th century with oak panels and not painted ones. That's interesting because during the 18th century he preferred painted panels, but not during the 19th century. The darkness was very fashionable at that time. He preferred darkness because it was very mysterious and so poetical. It is a time in France of Victor Hugo, for example, who born in the region here. Outside of the chateau, and you see that from the windows, there is a garden which was also planted during the mid-19th century, which is not a French garden. It's exactly the opposite. It is what we name a romantic-style English garden. That was a fashion in France at that time. He planted many local trees, but also many exotic ones. We'll go to see the apartment of Margaret of Bavaria. You remember she'd be the yes. second Duchess of Bavaria. The daughter-in-law. We'll That's it. We we'll see that the walls in her apartment are totally covered with original 14th century paintings. All the paintings you, you will see are considered today like the oldest princely decorations that kind which is conserved in France. Huh? We'll go upstairs. Oh my goodness. I cannot believe this is original. <laughs> <gasps> And it is. <laughs> they are conserved because during the 19th century, they put up on the wall plasters and wallpapers. So uh, 60 years ago, the paintings were discovered, then the plasters were removed, and 30 years ago, the paintings were restored. So you see them now. Huh? Uh, of course, the panels, uh, but also the corniche and the ceiling and the fireplace. dates from the beginning of the 19th century, but the painting from the 14th century, showing M's and P's which are the initials of Margaret of Flanders and Philip the Bold, the Duchess and the Duke of Burgundy. You see that the background is a green one, which is normal, because green is color of nature, and you remember, huh? she wanted to have here a very bucolic place. Green was the right color of the right place, huh? like nature coming inside of the walls. And flowers in between yeah. their names. Yes, but the flowers are thistles. They loved, uh, in all Western Europe, during the Middle Ages, huh? they loved to give to patterns a symbolic meaning. And the thistle is a very interesting example, because first, it is symbolizing respect. It's a very noble flower, huh? but it's also a very pricking one. So you do admire it, you don't touch it, because it pricks you. Because of that, it is symbolizing respect. Scotland has a thistle like its emblem because of that. But the thing is that the thistle also is symbolizing link, because when you go through bushes with thistles in, the thistle will attach you. Sometimes it's difficult to go away, huh? because of that the thistle is symbolizing link and fidelity. Here they are linking the ducal couple. Uh, the other thing is that a kind of thistle, which is named in English a teasel, was used. Because during the Middle Ages, they cut up the flowers, putting them on brushes, and with that they brush the wool. They tease the wools with teasels and wool. That was the main Flemish industry. Flanders was rich and very rich because of wool during the Middle Ages, and we were in Margaret of Flanders' place, and she knew that. You see how it works such a symbol here. And we know many things concerning the paintings. For example, we know the dates of them. They were done during winter, 1389-1390. We know also the name of the painter, Jean de Beaumetz. And he was the official painter, meaning that with his workshop, he did all the paintings in all the ducal properties. The shame is that today most of them are totally gone, meaning that the unique decorations surviving today are the one you will see here. And we know where we are. Eh? Here we are in Margaret of Bavaria's dressing room. Next was the bedroom. That is very normal, eh? because when you're a prince or princess at that time in such a place, you have two rooms in your apartment. You have a bedroom, which is a place for resting during the night. Eh? But for receiving during the day, during the day, you do receive your bedroom, which is a salon, an official room, which is not the dressing room where we are, which is totally private. Huh? 
For example, in the dressing room, you stock your clothes in chests. You could have your intimate activities, like washing your... There were bathrooms, ground floor, huh? but you could have your washing done here. And in such a place, there was always a bed. Because during the night here, we're sleeping, a lady in waiting, a domestic. Like that, they were next to the bed of the princess. So that is the private part, the intimate one, the technical one, next to the bedroom, which is the official one. And you do see here that there is a doorway which continued under the, the panel, and that doorway opened to the apartment which was next, which was the apartment of John the Fearless, her husband. In her apartment, Margaret of Bavaria had the, the initials of a mother-in-law and a father-in-law. Huh? I think that it was a way to show her, because she was really young when she went here, she was something like 15 years old, huh? and she had to understand that she was coming in a new family. The family of the Dukes of Burgundy had their initials on the walls. Uh, she she knew very well that she was not in her place, but in the place of her new family. It was a way to show that to her. We know today that during the Middle the thistles were not white on a green background. They were covered with a gold leaf. But it was a very thin gold leaf, huh? so it's gone today. It was refrigerated. It must have been glorious, glittering yeah. in the candlelight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there is something else which is quite interesting because maybe you see on that wall that all the M's are similar and very simple, but all the P's are different and decorated. If you see these four P's here, for example, the feet of them, they are never the same. And there are many things which are changing from one P to another one. Huh? All the P's are different and decorated, but all the M's are similar and simple. In Western Europe, at the end of the Middle Ages, in the intellectual levels of society, huh? they lived in a way which was named in French l'amour courtois, which is in English courtly love, in a very elegant way. For example, the Duke, he gave up to the Duchess the chateau here, which is a very elegant attitude, but the Duchess, she had to do something the other way. Huh? So asking here to a painter in her chateau to decorate, not the end of the piece, not herself, but himself, it was a way to give a homage to the Duke. She was like decorating the Duke in her chateau, huh? uh, flourishing him. Huh? That kind of thing was very fashionable in France at that time. Here we are in a corridor, but which didn't exist during the Middle Ages, because corridors don't exist at that time. Here during the 14th century, each room was as wide as the chateau itself. During the beginning of the 19th century, they built up that wall to make a corridor and independent bedrooms, like that one. What you see here, is a bedroom, which was organized during the mid-19th century, but in the 14th century volume. And what happened is that 20 years ago here, another test was done, and other paintings were discovered dating from the 14th century, showing, of course, on a green background, and nature is everywhere, huh? showing peas, like Philippe, and daisies, Margaret's, like on the ties we saw before. And that is interesting, because we know, because of archives, that the apartment of Margaret of Flanders was decorated with peas and margarets. So here we are in her apartment. Huh? We are normally in the apartment of the daughter in law, but in the apartment of the mother in law, Margaret of Flanders, here was a dressing room, because that wall didn't exist. Huh? But the first part of the corridor, which is wider, corresponds to the bedroom, which was bigger, of course, and linked to the staircase. Because when you went to see Margaret, she didn't receive you in the private dressing room, but in the official bedroom, which is linked to the staircase. Uh, meaning also that under the plasters and wallpapers you see here, certainly, the original paintings are conserved. But the idea is not to demolish all what is not from the Middle Ages, because of course this of the chateau didn't add with the Middle Ages. It's like, uh, you know, several levels of history, one upon the others. So it's important to show the whole history of the chateau, which didn't end with the 14th century. Because here it's exactly the same. You have another room, another bedroom, which was also organized during the mid-19th century, but in the 14th century volume. But here, both sides of that window, there are all the paintings dating also from the Middle Ages, which are very badly conserved at the bottom, but very well on the top, showing roses. You see two roses there, there is one there. Uh, so it is not the same decoration than before, because it's no more the same apartment. That was the Duke's Philippe apartment. We are leaving Margaret coming to Philippe's bold apartment. Uh, here during the 14th century, there were two rooms, meaning that ground floor there was a kitchen, like the one we saw before. But first off, because the ground where we were, where you are, went before to the tapestry. So here first of all was a big room, and you see the ceiling of it, and it was a very big one. It was a duke's bedroom, next to the duke's dressing room, the one with the roses we saw before. That was a duke's apartment. Huh? 
But what happened is that at the end of the 18th century, they wanted here to have a large hall because there were no big halls in chateaus at that time. So they wanted to create one here during the 18th century. So they demolished the floor ceiling to do the big vestibule you see. They built up the staircase, meaning that today you have a double staircase. That is the new 18th century staircase next to the original 14th century spiral one, which is here in the corner. And one century ago here, they finished the decorations. For example, they hung up here the big Aubusson 17th century tapestry, but they brought also here the big fireplace which is here, which was not here before. Because during the 14th century, that big fireplace was in the reception room, the one we saw before in the other wing. Eh? They rebuilt it here, but narrower, before it was wider. Eh? And if the two pillars are medieval ones, the lintel is not, no more the mantle. Uh, you remember that during the Middle Ages there was no mantle because the top of the fireplace was flat. It was like a balcony for the musicians. The sculptures of the fireplace were done by the official sculptor of the Duke and the Duchess because Philip and Margaret, they had an official sculptor whose name was Klaus Sluter. He was the official sculptor of the Duke and the Duchess. He was a Dutch artist. Huh? He did all the sculptures with, uh, uh, with his workshop including the sculptures we'll go to see now on the, on the fireplace. I would like to show you the sculpted capitals of the fireplace, which are very interesting ones. Huh? Here there is a woman, uh, she was beheaded during the French Revolution. Huh? Here there is a man, and imagine that he was also beheaded. But the thing is that 10 years ago in the cell of the excavations, remember that we saw the cell at the beginning, we discovered the head here. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. It had been missing all yeah. these hundreds of years. Yeah. And recently, a concert restricted it in the wrong position. And to know who they are, you have to look at the capital, which is on the uh, left side. And you will see that on the right side, there is a lion whose muscle is cut. Uh, here there is, on the left side, a griffin whose head is gone. And between the two, there is a knight. Uh, he was also beheaded. Huh? But you see his breast and his arm and his sword with a sword. He's killing the dragon. Huh? You will see his right leg, not the left one, which is gone, but there is a left foot. So there is a dragon, a knight, and a lion. That is the story of a bold knight whose name is Ivanhoe. You know, Ivano is one of the knights of the own table. The company of King Arthur, like Lancelot, for example. Yes, who Sir Walter Scott wrote about later. That's it. And he says that one day, Ivano went to wood and he saw a dragon attacking a lion. But because he was bold, he decided to kill the dragon, which is a devil creature, and to save the lion. Because the lion is a very noble creature. Huh? And of course, the lion was very happy to be freed. And to thanks the knight, he decided to become his companion. And the name of that legend is... Ivanhoe, the knight with the lion, and in France is very well known. Because during the 12th century, a French author, whose name is Chrétien de Troyes, wrote the story of Ivanhoe. In Ivanhoe, the knight with the lion, he says that one day Ivanhoe became totally mad. But one day, he met a hermit living in a house in the forest. You do see the forest, the house of the, and the hermit coming away. And the thing is that the hermit regave to Ivanhoe the sanity lost before. So what you see here are two scenes from one of the oldest romances of the French literature. And it shows the culture and yeah. the art, the yeah. literary level yeah. of the court. Absolutely, that is very important. And because of that, Margaret of Flanders put it on the fireplace. But suddenly she did that for another reason. Putting Ivan on the fireplace was suddenly for her a way to suggest a kind of link between that mythic hero, Ivano, and the new hero who is Philip the Bold. He's a new Ivano. And we think today that the two persons which are in front huh, uh, are here, Ivano, and in front, Lodin. Lodin whose uh, head is gone today, was the dame of Ivano. Allegorical portraits yes. of, the, of the Duke and the Duchess. The chivalrous couple come to life in their modern age. That's it. And the same sort of theatre that she was yeah. performing in the chapel. That's it, exactly. It is always that. And it's that idea of courtly love again, le roman de la rose. It's, it's exactly the same kind of atmosphere. As you can see, we have had such a fascinating tour for so long. It is now dark outside. Vous aviez été tellement généreux avec votre temps et avec toute l'information que vous avez sur ce château. Je me suis régalé. Merci. Tant mieux. And I hope that we see you at La Lande one day. If you're I, ever I, I, in the I would like to see that because I saw photographies, but not the real château. So you have to yes, go there. Absolutely, yes. you're invited. Like to go there Anytime. To see that. <laughs> Merci infiniment. Merci à vous.